stories don't define you. How you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker of Elkins Consulting. When we share stories, whether in our personal or business lives, how we share them makes a difference in how we remember them and in how we're perceived by the people we're sharing them with. When you're listening to this podcast, I encourage you to listen and consider your own related stories. To listen and think about which stories in your life might have impacted you in a similar way. And think about how you share those stories and the messages they carry for you and for the people who are hearing them. I have chosen to re-interview somebody that I interviewed on my podcast in a previous episode. But so much has come together in my head over the last eight months with different people that I've interviewed on podcasts, different books that I've read in relation to our self-actualization and how we behave based on what we know about our place in the world and the environment that shaped us. So I invited Mark Bowden to come back to Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Well podcast, because a lot of what he does connects a lot of what I've been reading and listening to. And I just thought it would be another fascinating conversation. So Mark, thank you so much for joining me again. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be back with you. Thanks for inviting me back for a little bit more. (laughs) Well, you know it's good when you leave them wanting more, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah. Yeah. Or it's, uh, you know, or or you've done something wrong and they they want you back to punish you. I don't know. Could be be one or the other. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm, I'm hoping not to do any punishing here. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure that's, that's, that's not the case here. Well, the last time we spoke, um, I asked you to share something about yourself that most people didn't know. And you t- talked about the traditional folk dancing that you did oh, yeah. in, yeah. as you were growing up. Can you tell me that again, just so that our listeners have a little more context for you if they didn't listen to the first one? Yeah, so so most people would not know that um, for many many years I, I used to do what, Morris dancing, which is traditional male um, folk dance uh, from uh, Britain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can't explain it any better than that. That's, <laughs> well, <laughs> I did YouTube actually. It, um, go onto YouTube and, and take a look. And that's exactly what I did um, on that other episode. And for our listeners, I will add that link to the previous episode with Mark. Um, I did include, I embedded a YouTube link that demonstrates some of that dancing and what it looks like and the music, the the uh, rhythms that go with it, which I found especially fascinating. Great. Great. So, um, Mark, one of the things we talked about in that first episode was um, the the importance of being inauthentic based on your 2013 Toronto TEDx talk. Hmm. Um, so can you just kind of briefly describe what that TEDx was about? Yeah. So first of all, I need to say, you know, the original, the title there, the importance of being inauthentic and the, and proffering forward the idea of inauthenticity was, you know, in itself meant to be provocative. It was, uh, n- not, not that it's not true, but, uh, the whole idea was designed to go, this is probably not what you're expecting. Because the climate out there, as I saw it, was full of this idea of authenticity. I mean, you couldn't move for people mm-hmm. being authentic. I mean, you know, uh, you, you threw a, a bread roll in a restaurant and it would surely hit somebody not being authentic, trying to be more authentic or being very authentic. So... <laughs> <laughs> and just, you know, everybody was describing everybody else as either authentic or inauthentic or, you know, themselves trying to be more authentic. Right. And all those, uh, and so, those yeah, articles and, and posts saying, this is how absolutely. to be more authentic. <laughs> yeah, you should be okay. more authentic or, the, you know, being authentic <laughs> is good and not being authentic is very bad. Right. Uh, and so this, this very binary attitude had happened around this idea around authenticity and I wasn't even sure whether everybody really had the same idea anyway about what authenticity was but the the idea I took was that um some people's idea of authenticity that idea of being you know truly comfortable and 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 feeling you know good in your own skin and 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 um I guess at ease with the Mm -hmm. world around you um, centered, 
uh, something of a of a of a self actualization, maybe like mm-hmm. a, a um, that actually uh, all they were doing was just being comfortable about themselves and not really, I guess, uh, going into the conflicts that are there around them and not, I guess, uh, taking the opportunities of conflict that the world offers to you in order to maybe grow even more or not, or even get destroyed. Uh, (laughs) So so what was happening was is that people were not noticing other people around them because they were being too authentic. They were, they were instantly making those snap judgments of like, this is not a person for me. I don't feel authentic around that person or that person isn't authentic with me. Therefore, I'm taking them out of my life or I don't need to talk to them. I need to go and find authentic people because I'm authentic. And they were just missing out on a whole bunch of great opportunities really because they weren't able to say, I just don't feel comfortable around this person. They, they say stuff which is, rubs me up the wrong way and I don't like it. So they were mistaking not liking for people being inauthentic or, um, or them being in a place where they couldn't be authentic. Or comfortable. Does, does that make sense? Or comfortable? Yeah. yeah does that make well, sense? Yes. And the way that I describe it when I talk about you and your work and some of um, our original conversation from last year was when people get so comfortable in their comfort zone that they Hmm. call their comfort zone authentic. I I wish you'd have said that right from the start because then I would, that's a much better explanation than I could. (laughs) That was like short and to the point. (laughs) I'm a very visual person. And my friend Kevin Strauss had this description where he had a circle of comfort and you're in that comfort zone. And then when you step out of it is when you grow. But every time you step out of it, you expand that comfort zone so that your discomfort actually gets smaller the more you step out of it. Does that make sense? Hmm. Yeah, interesting. You know, I, what comes to mind for me around that is, is, is growing costs. So, like, growing isn't comfortable. Right. Growing costs. Right. And mm-hmm. so um, I don't know whether you've ever uh, – well, let me put me – put it in my context, you know, when I, when I moved away from my, the home that I was born in, literally born in, I was literally born at home and I moved away from the house that I'd lived all my life in and that I was actually born in the actual point that I was born in (laughs) and started living somewhere else. It was quite expensive because it, it, it was a big shift, not only in moving geography but the type of people that i was with and the type of person that i wanted to gravitate to being being more like Mm -hmm. um and who i wanted to be and what i wanted to do and so when i'd go back to the literal place i was born to the literal people i was born by um born of it was painful it was painful for them because i'd changed so change Mm -hmm in many cases costs and it's painful and 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 it would have been easier for me to go you know what doesn't really feel authentic for me where i am right now i think i'll just go home and Aww. be back there it's a bit more comfortable but i didn't i kept on going through it and 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 now you know sometimes it's still very difficult being back in that place that i was born in because i it's very difficult for me to be who I am now back there because I in don't that fit so well. Yeah, I just well, don't fit and so their well ex- there. Their expectations of you haven't shifted of who you are because they haven't watched you grow. They've been separated from it. So they mm-hmm. expect you to be the same person when you come back that you were when you left and you're not. Well, I don't, I, you know, I don't know whether they, I'd have to ask them to work out whether that's their expectation, but but here's what I, I would presume, is I would presume they still hold some of the values and beliefs and rituals and customs and goals, concerns and signals that I don't hold anymore. And so 
therefore they see a very different person and I behave as a very different person and sometimes it clashes and I don't understand them and they don't understand me. And there's not a lot that we can do about that because the values and beliefs and the goals and concerns are very deeply uh, embedded and mine, some of mine changed. And it's not like they changed painlessly. They changed with right. pain. Well, relationships, that, that shift in relationships is always going to cause pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, right. that, that, is most, that is most likely. Yeah. You know, my example of that was when um, I was raised in a very traditionally Jewish household. And, mm-hmm. um, and I stayed in that kind of mindset for a little while after I left home. But I moved from Washington, D.C. Uh, with my husband and a six-month-old baby to Montana to a city with no synagogue. And right. honestly, that didn't bother me because I never felt like that's where I got my spirituality. I never felt like mm. I was more Jewish in a synagogue than I was at home. So it didn't bother me at all. And I knew that whatever rituals, I never considered myself particularly religious, but I always loved the rituals and values associated with Judaism. And right. so I knew that I could have those in my household without having a synagogue. And I remember those first few years when my mom would come to visit or when we'd talk, I could hear the pain in her voice as she understood that I had shifted away from that kind of Judaism, her traditional Mm. Judaism, what she saw as being Jewish. I was kind of dismissing, partly because there was no synagogue here and partly because it never served me. And I will never forget, you know, having that tension when I, even when I first said, oh, we're moving to Helena, Montana, my mom said, but there's no synagogue there. And like, I, could, I could definitely feel her disappointment, not just in the situation, but in me, like that I was willing to be in a place where there wasn't going to be that kind of community. But I remember vividly, you know, kind of moving through it and helping her see that it was okay and that we weren't losing our sense of being Jewish, that identity of being Jewish. But what was fascinating was that when she came to visit me just a few years ago, we've been here 21 years now, and it was probably five or six years ago she came to visit in the summer, and we walked up to the top of the mountain behind my house, and it is a hike. It's about a thousand foot climb, and it's pretty steep, and it took us a while. But we got to the top, and I looked at her, and I breathed so deeply, and I could see that she was really taking taking in this view. And I said, mom, this is where I find my spirituality. This is my Mm -hmm. synagogue. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, I I remember this moment so vividly because she looked at me with tears in her eyes because she finally understood it. And she could see me for who I was in the past and still be able to um, confront that discomfort that she had about who I am now. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. There's a great tradition in, uh, in Judaism of climbing up mountains to uh, get spiritual. Yes. <laughs> and then, and, then coming and down, I do it literally. Coming down again with, with, with something. <laughs> yes. But, you know, and we came so, down you know, you're, understanding. You're, sure. So you're, you know, you're, you're, you're following in a great line there. But I guess those, those old desert nomads would be, you know, shocked that you might tuck into some shellfish. Or a, or a <laughs> yes. lobster, no, or a um, slice of bacon. <laughs> slice right, of bacon. <laughs> because uh, you know they didn't have uh, refri- they were desert nomads with no refrigeration, and not you know the last thing you want to do is have a shellfish because that'll kill you most. Likely. Yes, yes, exactly. But so as your I'm environment curious. changes, as your environment changes, some of the customs are not necessarily necessary anymore to survive in that environment, but the tradition, the custom continues on because if you delete the custom, the worry is you'll delete the value. There's exactly. an equation of the, you know, we do the custom because it, it shows that we're part of this value system. But often the custom and, was really just to stay alive. Right, but it's an, and an identity. I mean, it's not and just an value system, it's your identity. Sure, um, how do you know who's Jewish part person. of your gang and not part of your gang? Exactly. Gang won't be eating the shellfish. 
Exactly. And even now, as we grow and change, one rabbi um, describes the reason some people will eat shellfish, they don't keep kosher, but they won't eat pork products is because the it's more um, a principle of it, that there is one thing that Jews won't eat. And part of that is that it was a pig that they used to desecrate the temple when they destroyed the, the temple in whatever, 5000 BC. Right. So um, it definitely contributes to identity, which really brings us right into this whole conversation about um, how our identity is shaped and how our self-actualization is shaped by our environment and as we change environments. So when was it that you realized that you didn't fit in that puzzle piece anymore? Was there something well, that think, happened? No, I think it, well, I think it probably, um, well, I mean, there, there are a couple of ways that probably change happens. It's either, either shockingly quick or, <laughs> right. or, 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 or over time. You're either boiling the right. frog or, or right. electrocuting the frog. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so, oh, yuck. <laughs> um, but no, I think, I think as, you know, for me, things, uh, you know, gradually as I uh, went into my adolescence and, and uh, started looking at music and art and, and what and film and what I enjoyed most. And then there was a, a gravitation away from the, the, the general likings of many people around me. I wasn't by any uh, sense unique, but, um, but unique enough that it seemed like I should go to where those unique people all showed up and you'd be less unique. Was there anyone, <laughs> yes, to find your tribe, so to speak. Sure. Um, yeah. Was there anyone in your, your home or your hometown that really tried to dissuade you from doing that, like actively? Oh, I think every, everybody tries to active, actively because they care about you. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Just like the rabbi is going to go, yeah, you really shouldn't eat that because they care about you. So, so right. of course it was full of, full of people caring for you and going really don't, don't do that. You'll cause their worry is harm. Of course, what you tend yeah. to maybe translate it into is they, they want to stop you. They want to stop you being you. But for them, you're already you. They're not inside your head. They don't know that that for you, you're maybe not, you're, you're trying to work out who you are. Right. And, and they don't and, want to see you uncomfortable. It makes them sad to see you uncomfortable. Yeah. So, well, they mirror the dis discomfort. So uh, when you're uncomfortable, they're uncomfortable. And so... Right. Which is I, ironic. I mean, this, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for people to be around discomfort. It's, it's painful. So, so we try and suppress it or stop it in other people, you know, uh -huh. don't feel like that. Don't think that it's not like that. The world isn't like that. Uh, isn't that ironic? We're okay. Don't you, I, it just occurred to me as we were talking that that is somewhat ironic because you would have been even more uncomfortable being in a place where you didn't really feel like that was your tribe. Yeah, but they don't know that because you're in their head. So, so they see you as a, you know, as an aspect of them. Right. Not, not you. That's right. pretty hard. Okay. That's pretty. Like, you know, <laughs> have you ever been in front of somebody and you've gone, "No, I really see," you know, "I really see you." It's like I'm not sure you do. I mean, I I get right. that you feel like you do, and that's really nice for you. That's. I get that, but I, but I, I don't think that's actually true. doesn't well, mean you're not feeling are, what you're feeling. Right. I think our parents and siblings do that more than anyone else because they think they know you they, because they watched well, they, you grow up. Oh, yeah. Well, they, they've got, they've got there's some strong similarities. Right? Mm -hmm. There might be some massive disparities given the strong similarities, which, again, can be pretty painful. It's like, hang on. We all grew up in the same place. Why are they treating you like this and me like that? So that can be that can be trouble. Um, but there's <laughs> yes. some there's some strong similarities. Like me and my siblings, we all grew up in the same house. So we all know the same house. We all know the same town. Now, you know, was it different for us in that house? Yeah, it was different. 
But were there some similarities? Yeah, massive similarities. So that can cause us to, to think we, we know somebody else. It can actually mean we do know. We do know. We totally do get it. But we shouldn't mistake what we do get for what we actually don't get. Ooh. Because I get something doesn't mean I, don't, I get everything. And it's easy to go to everything. Yeah, I totally get it. You, you're my brother. You're my sister. Obviously, I totally get it because I might not. That's a huge distinction, Mark. Mm. I hadn't thought about it like that at all. That, that really changes things. And it actually gives us a really good tool when we're trying to talk to people who think so differently from us. Once we found our commonality, once we found what we have in common, our, our mutual concerns and, and values, being able to understand that we understand what we do have in common, but how do we have that conversation about those things that we don't have in common? Yeah, well, that's, that's tricky, isn't it? Because then you might start disliking the person because you liked them because you had the thing in common, maybe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you might dislike them because you have that in common but uh, <laughs> more likely uh, my gamble would be it's more more likely going to cause liking so right. you know if we're getting on and we have some you know some commonalities and and there feels to be some you know sympathy some some simpatico with each other and uh you know at what point am i going to go you know what well, let's discuss how we're very different <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, you don't yeah. want to undo all Tell me the about good your, that you just did. Exactly. Tell me about your politics. How did you vote last time? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think of, you know, what do you, <laughs> like, cause I might, I might have to go, no, you're wrong. That's ridiculous. You're wrong. Right. But you have to come back to that whole idea that you don't know what you don't know. Um, and it, it comes back to uh, this thing that I, I mentioned before I hit record, which is a book by Monica Borgo called The Change Code. And it's really an application of a, a theory of spiral dynamics that was by Claire Graves, Dr. Claire W. Graves back like 30 years ago. And the concept is that rather than having this hierarchy like Maslow's hierarchy, we really need to look at um, self-actualization on a spectrum. We need to start with understanding the environment that shaped a person before we try to communicate with them about solving a major problem. So um, when, as you were talking about your family and the people, your, your siblings, that you all grew up in the same place and you have that same idea, and yet your self-actualization is probably a different place on that spectrum than theirs in terms of how they see their role in community versus how they see their role as an individual. Yeah, oh, for sure. For sure. We, we, we uh, grew up in the same place um, under some different circumstances. And mm-hmm. so I wouldn't at all presume that, that, um, that, that, that um, things are alike for us in in many ways, yeah, and and certainly on this spectrum of self actual. I mean, first of all, with self actualization, I'm 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 often a little bit confused about exactly what people mean by mm. that. Like, mm-hmm. what is that? What does that look like? <laughs> like, well, how, would I, how would you know? <laughs> right, right. It's kind of like being authentic. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, what are you- and I, and I don't think it's something that I can tell somebody, you are self-actualized. I think it's somebody that has to know that they are in a certain place in how they understand their, themselves and their role in any given community. So on the, the spiral dynamics in that, that spectrum, it starts with that sense of um, real uh, kind of obliviousness about the world around you. Um, and just getting your needs met, immediate needs met, which is you know, as a baby. And when you think mm. about um, first first humans, it's really about what in the next two minutes is going to make me happy and get my needs met. And mm. then as we get into toddlerhood, the world starts to revolve around us. And we're really all about independence. We're all about doing it. I can tell you my first words were by self. So mm. it was really about getting my own needs met through any means and um, 
really being the center of the universe. And then, um, and of course, you can even see that in some parts of early man as they started to um, really uh, strive for being on their own and being able to uh, support or, or feed themselves and keep themselves warm. And then as they shift into a more communal self-actualization, that is more about understanding that in groups we can be safer and we can provide more resilience and longevity when it comes to feeding each other. If we collect and have different jobs within a community that we can support each other and your the longevity is going to improve in terms of life and, and probably some level of satisfaction and happiness. Um, and then eventually that gets too um, controlling to some people and some people will start to shift out of that level, that um, not level, that's the wrong word, out of that part of the spectrum and into something that is again, more independent where um, they really want to get their own needs met, but they want to contribute somehow. And it, it just keeps growing from there. And it keeps going back and forth between this individualized um, need for happiness and survival um, back into a communal way of living and what's best for our communities. And then that gets controlling again and people start to break out again. So the book really describes this spectrum and, and where the majority of people within a community are on that spectrum. And what keeps coming to mind as I hear your description of um, how the environment shapes us and yet how we don't necessarily know what others are feeling and how they're going through things. The difficulty always comes back to communication. So the, in the, the spiral dynamics image that I, I have in my head and that I'll share um, on the blog post associated with this podcast, what eventually happens is we get to a point where we recognize and can live in any of those places on the spectrum within those communities um, and do that without judgment. So the, the issue is that each level of that up to a certain point, there's a lot of judgment about the people in the previous part of the spectrum. And any given circumstance can drive us to regress back into any given part of that spectrum. So for instance, um, Jews during the Holocaust, when they were all about survival, may have shifted backward and um, not been able to be who they normally would be given those circumstances. So the question comes back to how do we communicate with people in different parts of that spectrum um, without judgment? Because we can't solve major problems in the world by judging. Yeah, so good, good description there of that uh, model. Very interesting. Uh, what what springs to mind to me um, immediately before I go into like how do you not judge them is is just uh, the economics of it. Mm-hmm. In that, um, you know, economically, uh, if you're safe in the group, but the group is under pressure. Uh, how do you then contribute it, contribute anything extra to the group? How do you move towards the self actualization piece of being able to uh, move between each of these and make those choices when uh, economic pressures might be pushing you down into that just wanting what you what you want because it's just a basic need or that independence piece which feels to me like you know you know what you want. You're no mm-hmm. longer a child, just wanting. You like know that you want now. You're you're um, you're cognizant that you mm-hmm. want something. It doesn't and stop it doesn't, you wanting it, right? And it doesn't matter if somebody else has it. You will take it from them if that's what you want. Absolutely, mm-hmm. uh, but but what do we do around the economic pressures around that? Because I I know I want that, and they have it, and I can't get it any other way. Um. So, so it seems to me like to be able to move around some of this, you, you need a certain economic in, environment so that you're not um, pushed into just fundamental needs. I'm on my own. 
there's nobody's going to get me this. I need to just go and get it for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, look, how do we, how do we then, how are we empathetic to people who are in different areas of, of that? Uh, I think the only way I could approach it is to try and ask about the, the time or the place or the, or the environment that they're living in right now. Mm-hmm. to get a sense of the pressure that they're under or not under to get a right. sense of of why it would be perfectly reasonable right um and human for them to be in that place mm. because these are all human beings right every every you know I, the model is just taking human beings and putting them in a bucket right categorizing um, Categorizing them, which our yeah. brains love to do. Oh, I love categorizing. <laughs> I love the model. The model is great. I don't know whether the model is uh-huh. accurate or not, but it doesn't really matter because it's a model. So, so all it does is make right. the very complex world way simpler for me. My brain likes that because it goes, "Okay, good, we've sorted that out." Then, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> great. But, give, and, me the, and give me the sorting, next. Give me the next problem. Right, and sorting doesn't necessarily imply judgment. Uh, no, sorting just means sorting. I put you in the category. I mean, in, in this case, I didn't make the categories. Right. So, so I can just go, okay, what category do you best fit into? Right. I'm not, not judging you. I'm just using the model. Right. Um, so, so then, you know, another step would be, can I understand why you might fit into that category? Why it might be reasonable that, you fit within this model into that category Mm -hmm. because if I don't do that, then I'll probably, and I I like the model and I see myself as being in a different area of that model. I might start just judging you and going, "Ah, I got, I see where you are. I'm, I'm in, I contribute to the group, but you're just independent. So I'm, I think that's, I'm better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be the assumption, wouldn't it? My guess is, my guess is if we were to poll people, you know, where's it better to be that, that in that independence bucket or in the contributor to the group bucket, my guess is most people are going to go, oh, yeah, you've got to be, that's good, be in that contributor to the group bucket. That's, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and, and be authentic at the same time. That'd be nice. <laughs> and then, then you'll be very self-actualized and... <laughs> Basically, it becomes Look a bit of a, like a, like a, well, it becomes moralist. It's pretty, it always seems kind of quasi religious to me mm. and moralistic. Like I'm right. better than you because right. I fit into this bit. At the same time, though, I think if you can, if you can use your observation skills and understand and asking questions, being very curious about a person and, and how they're thinking and, and the way that they live, what, how the environment is shaping them. And if you can, if you have it in your head that this is okay, this person fits into this category. um, Now, what language can I use to make sure that we understand each other? And uh, it's kind of like, so I'm a, I'm a certified strengths finder coach. And in Mm -hmm. general, I don't like assessments. In general, I find those personality assessment assessments to be very self-limiting, especially based on our conversations Um, You know, once you decide, oh, I am this in Myers-Briggs, then you give yourself excuses to not step out of your comfort zone. Um, But what I find, at least with the Strengths Finder, is that these are categories, these are buckets that we fit ourselves into. Um, But the advantage is that I know when I behave a certain way that it's because this is how I think. And if I can flip that to say, okay, that wasn't a behavior I really liked or served me well. Um, how can I use this same strength to change that? So uh, as an example, um, I don't have the responsibility strength in my top strengths, which is there are 34 themes in that assessment. And responsibility mm-hmm. is somebody who is really motivated to be responsible. They uh, consider that part of their identity. I am a responsible person. And in most cases, you want that kind of person around you because they're going to show up when they say they're going to show up. If they think it's important, if it's part of what they see as responsible behavior, 
they're going to do it. And, and so it's a great person to have on a team that has, you know, high responsibility. At the same time, the same person can appear to be very judgmental because if they see somebody who is behaving in a way that is counter to how they describe responsible behavior, then they dismiss that person as being irresponsible. So it's, I find it very similar if we are looking at people on the spectrum of where they are and how they think about individualizing versus community, um, being able to understand where they're coming from, you might be able to solve some of the bigger complex problems like um, plastics in the ocean. If you don't argue about whether the science is accurate about climate change and start to describe how we can solve the problems that we can see, which is plastics killing off our oceans because they're covering them and raising the temperature, we can address that complex problem if we address it at that level as opposed to trying to do it at a higher, well, higher, more, more global understanding of it in terms of climate change. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, it does. It does. And I think, again, I, I would, well, a couple of things. First of all, I'd just go back to the economics of it because my guess is if, you, if you're able to think for some moments about plastic in the sea, um, and you, you live in Montana, yeah? Yes. And I'm, my geography is not particularly good, especially U.S. Right. geography, but, but it's Nowhere not by the sea, near. is it? Nowhere okay. near the beach or the ocean. Yeah. No. So you got, like, if I opened your fridge, it would be full right now. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. you, you, got time, you, got, you got time to think. Of you course. got enough yeah. food. Yeah, you got, like, so you can think about stuff outside of just, how, like, how am I going to get some water today or... or or milk for the kids or, um, and do I really care that it comes with a plastic straw? It's like, no, need, I just got to eat or, or so, so, and obviously there's a, there's a spectrum there. So, so, you know, how do I talk to, and, and like, you know, my factory makes the straws and that I get a minimal wage to make these, these plastic things that, you know, you've got time to think about that we shouldn't really be consuming, but it's my job that I feed my family and kids mm-hmm. with. What about the person who is making all the money as a result of these plastic straws? I'm not sure it's economics specifically, uh, because there are very, very wealthy people who don't think twice about using plastic straws or don't think about the environment in the same way that somebody who may be poor and trying very hard not to use plastic. <laughs> so I, I agree to a certain extent that, you know, I have the luxury of thinking about these things. Um, I'm not sure it's just economics though. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got the, the people who let's, let's, let's talk about the, the person who owns the, the factory. plastic straw mm-hmm. factory. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, which <laughs> is probably is probably owned by a larger company, which which um, has shareholders, and those shareholders are probably uh, it's their pension, it's the right. money that they've saved up for their retirement, and they're expecting some profitability from that mm-hmm. uh, because they they worked hard as a doctor or a nurse, and or something you know very very good, <laughs> and. And they were concentrated on that, so they didn't have time. You know, they're still saving people's lives, and they didn't have time mm. to really look into their investment company and what they were investing in, and and so forth. So, you know, it's just so um, tangled up that mm. I mean, you know, what can we do? Well, you cannot, you cannot buy them. Like you can do what you do, mm-hmm. um. But to convince other people to do what you do, that's, that's, that's pretty hard. It is. And one of the things that really discouraged me back when this is long before I started my communication coaching as, as my business, I read an article about um, vaccines and um, the fact that there was no way to communicate with people who did not believe in vaccines or didn't want to vaccinate Mm -hmm. their children that would be successful in helping them change their minds. So yes, 
basically this article was, it showed three different ways that they communicated with people who self-reported as anti-vaccine vaccines or on the fence undecided. Mm -hmm. And they showed them three different ways of communicating what the vaccines do or do not do. And, um, after and, and all three were very reasonable ways of presenting the information. Um, some were more image rich, some were more text rich, um, some focused on the, the reasons it works, and some focused on images of kids with, say, smallpox or um, mm. uh, some, I can't remember what the other one was. Um, and so they showed images of these children with it and, and then showed um, the truth versus myth about it, um, you know, having them side by side so you could see the truth is this, this is what people are saying, but it's not true and this is why. Um, and all three of these actually had, a, the majority was a negative response. So the people who were anti-vaccine stayed firmly in anti-vaccine and some, not all, but the majority of the people undecided ended up going toward anti-vaccine. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's tricky, isn't it? Because that's a belief. So, yes. you know, I may as well, I may as well just, just go, you know, when was the last time you tried to convince somebody orthodox that they, it's okay to eat bacon, <laughs> and that God won't be angry with them because it's, it's a figment. Right. <laughs> like, right. Try that one. Try that one. <laughs> and, and then... Once you've achieved that, whatever worked there, because of, because that's a that's a belief that people are allowed to have. That's a that's a sensible right. belief because it's religious, and people should have their religions. Anti-vaxxing, that's a silly belief, because, and people shouldn't have that one. Well, no, beliefs are beliefs. Right. Like, well, why one why one set of beliefs better than the others? Except that somebody, a, a, an Orthodox Jew eating pork, isn't going to infect somebody else with trichinosis. Well, no, but that's not really. I mean, <laughs> there's some. I mean, there but is but a they could well, they could, they could well stone somebody to death. Right, so, right. But consequences I mean, are different in that circumstance. It is. I agree that the belief is hard, is is um, reasonable to a certain extent, but the consequences of that belief. For instance, okay, let's do right. this. So if you think the, what you're saying is if you think the consequences are bad enough, they shouldn't have the belief. Well, no, not necessarily. I think that if the consequences are bad enough, we need to have that conversation with them and we need to find a way to um, help them see what the reality is for the rest of the community. So... Um, there's a story about uh, an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood in Jerusalem that actually guillotined um, a, a Jewish couple on a motorcycle mm -hmm. because their belief was that this Reformed Jew shouldn't be dating this Orthodox Jew. Right. So, yeah, that belief is not okay if it's going to come to the consequence of the murder of these two young kids. And when you think about it, the consequence of not vaccinating is it can be the equivalent of murder. It has been. It's been shown to be that. So Well then then based on that, if you can if the belief can murder one individual, then they're both as bad as each other and you need to eradicate both beliefs. Well and that's the question. Do we we can't. I mean you you know that that's impossible. No, you don't want so, to. No, right, you can do and you anything you like. To. There's just there's yeah. just cost. So, yeah, well, I don't know. Exactly. Wouldn't I want to? I mean, people have in history. People have wanted to enough that they've gone, okay, let's eradicate that. Yeah, let's so eradicate that. It depends Jews. who you are. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah. It, happens, so, so, it happens regularly on our planet. But so yeah, I, I yeah. guess it comes back down to once we understand the category, we, can we have a conversation with people that comes back to what do we have in common? We want our children to be healthy. We want all of our children to be healthy. I don't want my children to be healthy and your children to be sick. So how do we come to that understanding and then shift the conversation, remaining with that undercore value and shift the conversation to better understand why that belief is so strong and maybe come up with a compromise? I mean, 
It doesn't mean it's ah, okay. all or nothing. Okay, Here, I get it. So some people's beliefs uh, threaten threaten you. Absolutely. Right. And some people's beliefs don't threaten you. And the ones that don't threaten you are okay. And the ones that do threaten you are not okay. Well, not just me personally, but threaten the fabric of our communities. Health. Okay. They th- threaten you and your group. Yeah. All of our group and them. Well, yeah. it, it threatens themselves as well. Because I don't oh, want to see so now, their child so now you, get sick either. But, it, but, but you see, their belief is, is that uh, vaccine will kill their kids. And that's... Your belief that's, is, is that right. it's, it's like the, the, the two things are in conflict with each other. Right, no matter how much data we show. Yes, because it's a belief. Believe, when right. you give data to a belief, it doesn't make it go away. It just strengthens right. it. Because <laughs> now, now you're the person trying to enforce on them. You're, you're trying to give them rules about how the world works. And they have a belief that it doesn't work like that. So now you're bad and you're trying to oppress them and, right. and probably kill them in the process. So Mark, you're not helping me. What's the answer here? <laughs> Give me well, an the, easy well, answer. <laughs> the, the, the answer is, is to first of all, totally understand why they, why they think the world is like that and accept that. Mm-hmm. Just go, that's the way they think it works. Your chances of changing that are super low. It's, it's like if I had, you know, if I had an hour, I wouldn't be spending it on, on trying to convince somebody with strong beliefs that they're wrong. Right. What I'd be trying to do is mobilize the people with the same beliefs to, um, to activate even further. Hmm. You know, or find the people who who will be persuaded. So there's somebody well, with a belief, and there's somebody who will right. be persuaded. Right. And well, there's I think somebody that's who's really... so close. You just need to nudge them over the edge and just go, "Look, there's the syringe." <laughs> you, uh, it's like it doesn't cost you anything. Look, I'll pay for it. There you go. Right. I'll go. Oh, thank you, because I was only worried that it would cost me something. Because I don't have much right. money right now. Yeah, find out. The, so because I hadn't had underlying... much money, I kind of went, uh, I'm against it because having much, not enough money to buy it is embarrassing. So mm. I'd rather be vehemently against it rather than for it and embarrassed that I can't have it. Oh, back to the economics of it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because my looking at the model here, looking at the model here, if I can... If I can take that that child mm. uh, at the start of it and kind of bomb them with support and high economics, then then and put them amongst people the same, they'll get into a really strong group. Mm-hmm. If I then take all of that away from them, they'll go back. They'll go backwards. They'll regress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's my gamble. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, but that would be my my gamble. And as that regresses, my guess is is that is that other people would step in and go, let me give you a group to belong to and you'll be okay. No, we've seen that happen over and over in yeah. history. Yeah. yeah. And and let's scapegoat this other group. Sure. So so yeah, find a find a common enemy, you know, create the common group through the common enemy. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, and 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 when things are economically not so good, that's that's a good opportunity for mm-hmm. those kind of maneuvers. But again, I'd go back to the thing mm-hmm. instead of, uh, I think as you were saying, uh, you know, what language can I use to, um, to understand uh, what category you're in? Mm-hmm. And to be understood as well. And to be understood. Mm-hmm. Here's what I, I would be thinking. What, what language can I use around myself? to um accept you mm. because if and i can curiosity accept, is the word that i always yeah. well yeah curiosity would be the start mm-hmm. and then being able to go i totally accept that i get it mm-hmm. without judgment well, i can still judge <laughs> I, totally accept it. I totally accept that it, it's, it's wrong i don't think you're right but i totally accept that you you think you are right. 
Okay. And because maybe otherwise, that's where the shift happened. But possibly, but you just I, I'm, 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 I'm gambling that 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 maybe gives more opportunity for a shift than I, I now understand what bucket you're in and what I, bucket I'm in and mm. how different we are. And I think I have the language to be able to com- now talk you out of that bucket, which is a bucket well, that I invented. And that's, that's not necessarily... <laughs> and I'm probably very, very comfortable with you being in that bucket as well. Well, and that's Maybe not necessarily where it. that goes, that I want to talk you out of the bucket. It's more um, based on where you are, how can we solve these big problems? Yeah, but isn't but with that model, aren't you trying to move people... No, um, along no, it? no. It, You're not it trying has... to move people from independence into a into a group. No, no. The, the goal, you just... no. The goal isn't oh, okay. to move people within those. It's to um, to address major complex problems through compromise and understanding. Oh, okay, okay. Well, if that's if that's the the the, the yeah, if that's the goal of it, then then I would say that the the in my best guess is the route forward is accepting. Mm-hmm. find out how they see themselves, the words that they use, the vocabulary that they use to describe who they are and where they are and what, what it feels like and what it is, mm-hmm. and then go, okay, I get it. Yeah. You, you maybe go, I can't, I can't do that myself or that feels uncomfortable for me or I don't believe that or I don't think that's true, but I know you do. Mm-hmm. There's anyway, that's pretty, tri- that's pretty tricky to do. So It is. I mean, up. it's really hard, especially if you feel very strongly about something like um, immunizations or, or anything that is a really complex problem. So I, I appreciate that. And it, it, to me, it feels, like, um, it feels like kindness. It feels like it, it's not just compassion, which, you know, that's a, a key, being compassionate, but also demonstrating that kindness of acceptance. Yeah, I, I think that's fine if, if you see it. Yeah, I, I, the idea of kindness hadn't come to my mind, but that's just my mind. But I totally get that you see it as, as a kind, you know, a kindness <laughs> to do that. Yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. Kindness to do that and a compassion to do that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's, that's where, that, go ahead. Oh, it's just a word that's always tricky for me. It's always associated with the Dalai Lama. He seems to have kind of, you know, got the, got the compassion brand. Got it all. You know, right. how can you, how can you even utter the word compassion without <laughs> without Lama? thinking of the Dalai Lama? <laughs> yeah. I, I, one of the words that I used in my household when my boys were little, and I continue to use a lot with my coaching clients, is being considerate, and mm. that's really about understanding how you how your behaviors and actions um, impact the people and the environment around you. So mm-hmm. understanding that and, and being intentional about it. So if you want to do something, you have to know that when you do it, it's, it could negatively impact the people or the environment around you, but being intentional about it. And that to me is being about being considerate. Yeah. And, I think I, I like that word considerate. That's a, that's a, that, that's a, that's a good word as far as I can see. Yeah. Thank you. Because so you're right. It is, it is intentional. Like it doesn't, I, I was considerate by accident. It's not like, <laughs> right. it's possible, is it? <laughs> right. It implies understanding your role and your responsibility, your personal responsibility for, right. for your, the impacts that you have on the people and, and environment around you. So yeah, between that good. and kindness, I think um, we can come full circle to, even when our families don't understand us and we feel that friction, being able to take that step back and know this is why they are feeling uncomfortable around me. This is why this conversation didn't go the way I wanted it to. Yeah. Sounds good. I, 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 I like, I like the consideration piece. Yeah. Huh. Mark, this has been, this went a totally different direction than I had anticipated. (laughs) And I'm so glad because well, I hope it. I hope it. You know, did something. For I, certainly, I've enjoyed chat, chatting away. It's, I'm just sitting here chatting away with you. So, uh, so it's, it's, uh, <laughs> feels relatively easy well, for I me. I, listeners... I don't know whether it's been useful or helpful or or or, or clever or or intelligent. I'm not sure. From my point, wow. from my point, I would, 
<laughs> I would say that um, it was insightful and thoughtful. Um, there's another good word, thoughtful. Um, yeah, 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 sure. When, when people are thoughtful, I think others get more out of it. And clearly you weren't answering or um, just speaking without thinking about what you were saying and how it was related to our conversation, the, the main topic of the conversation. So I would say it's probably going to be very useful for people at, well, at, so. at a minimum, I mean, at a minimum to think about what we talked about and how we approach certain conversations. Certainly. Cause the, the, you know, this is stuff that I don't normally, you know, talk about on in, in, in interviews. And so you're absolutely right. I have been thinking about this and you know, right now, and, uh, you know, none of the, I don't have scripted answers for any of your questions. <laughs> many, <laughs> no. pod, many podcasts, it's, it's, ah, there's the, there's the question that I have a, a full and scripted answer to. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, not well. in this case. So thanks. Well, you know, that. I had to punish you because you came back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, 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 no punishment at all. It was great. For oh, you. good. Well, I really appreciate the conversation. I especially appreciate that um, story about, leaving home, the home you were born in, physically immediate, in that immediacy of, of being born <laughs> to the people that you were born from. <laughs> yeah. And that whole beginning of the conversation, that, that part of the story gave me a different context for you and for the rest of our conversation. So I really appreciate your sharing that aspect of your, your growing up and thought process. So thank you. Oh, thanks for a lovely interview. And it chat really more than an interview yeah yes Thank well you. that's what i like and um just for our listeners i will have a link to mark mark's um, tedx again um, which was also in the previous episode i will have a link to the previous episode and a link to mark's website so feel free to to review some of what he's done in the past i love the video from the tedx the toronto tedx in 2013 it's one of my favorites. I've watched it far too many times, probably. I probably know it better than you do, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, next time I'm asked to do it, you, you could maybe go and do it for me. Yeah, uh, I could do some there's, version there's, of it for sure. There's many, there's many people who are, who, who are big fans and they often go, oh, I love that speech. I've watched it X amount of times. I'm like, go, you get up there and give it a go. <laughs> yes. Well, you know what's funny about that is that I can't stand the sound of my voice recorded most of the time. So when people want to hear my singing, I'm happy to sing, but I'm not going to go listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> so I get it. Um, and also for our listeners, if you are interested, um, Mark has some great books out for you to read. And now seems to be a good time for people to be catching up on their reading. So thank you again, Mark. I look forward to our next conversation. Uh, great. Thanks again. I, I, and I'm happy to do it anytime. Thank you for listening to Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will. If you're planning an event or company retreat and want to bring in a memorable, entertaining, and highly practical speaker as your keynote speaker or workshop facilitator, please visit us at elkinsconsulting.com to learn how we can help and provide a memorable keynote or breakout session. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from you. Could you tell me that you're going away?